Good evening. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. We are in still in the first chapter of Luke this week, and um, so let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your lessons that you teach us. Lord, we just pray tonight for this lesson. Lord, I pray that you would teach it through me, that it would not be my words, but yours. Father, I thank you that, um, that your presence is with us. Father, we need you. We need you now so badly. I lift up those that are suffering with COVID, Father, for families and for ones who are critically ill. And Lord, I just lay them before you for your comfort and your peace. Father, for those that are recovering and have recovered, I praise you and thank you. But Father, I just pray, Lord, that you will accomplish what you have set out to accomplish with this, that hearts will be drawn to you, that our nation, our world will be changed, and that we'll be drawn back to you. Father, use it for your glory and for your honor, and just help us to understand and to accept when we don't understand your ways and to trust your wisdom, Father. So again, Father, I ask you to use this lesson to guide us, to teach us, to mold us and make us what you want us to be. Forgive us where we fall so short. In Jesus' name, I pray. I hope you're all doing well. Um, we have a couple of um, dear, sweet uh, friends, church uh, people that um, are not expected to make it through COVID. And uh, it's been very difficult, a difficult day talking with some of them. So just your prayers, your prayers for, for them and for their sweet families. Um, it's kind of hard. We are working our way into the birth of Jesus. And of course, we are in the Christmas season. And it's, it's a little hard this year to get into the jingle of it. And the, um, I decorated a little bit at the church today. And it's, it's just hard. Christmas has kind of sneaked in on me. And I don't like that because I love Christmas. I would be Christmas year round. I would leave my tree up and I would just, that would just please me fine. And this year it's just been different. The, the spirit is there, but it's just a little different. And so I'm hoping that this year we will look on the real reason for Christmas and not on the manufactured reasons and that we'll use this year, because it is a little different, to look at Christmas a little differently. Um, today, our lesson picks up just where it left off last week, still in chapter one of Luke, and um, where we left with uh, Isaiah and Elizabeth to expect a child, and that Elizabeth uh, kind of hid it from everyone for five months. Well, now we are, we are at the sixth month of her pregnancy, and here's what happens to Mary now this week. And this is chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. <clears throat> There's a lot of information in those two little short verses. Um, Elizabeth is pregnant. She's six months pregnant. And the same angel that had gone to Zacharias to tell Zacharias that he was going to have a son, that his wife would have a son in her old age, has now come and appeared to Mary. And so Gabriel, again, sent from God, and he was sent into the area of Galilee, into a city called Nazareth. Nazareth was, we, we wouldn't look at it as a city in our definition of cities. Uh, it was rather small, kind of unimportant. Uh, as a matter of fact, in John, John, uh, I think it was Nathaniel, someone says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, Nazareth was just kind of, you know, nondescript. Um, no one important came from there. And so Gabriel was sent to this little town, this city in, in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin. 
you know, it's important that Mary was a virgin because Isaiah, we just finished Isaiah, had said, and the, and the prophets have said that Messiah would be born to a virgin. And so here Gabriel has come to visit this virgin. And she was a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph. So now we know that she was a spouse, totally different from any customs that we have. When they were espoused, we kind of equated with being engaged, but it was much more legally binding than an engagement. You know, if you're engaged and you decide to break off the engagement, you just give the ring back and it's all over. You know, it's 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 done. But they were literally legally bound once they were they were espoused. They had a kind of a marriage ceremony. They were legally bound. And then for a year, they did not live as a married couple. They The girls still lived with their family. They still lived separately. They had no marital relation. And then at the end of that year, they had another ceremony, and they actually began to live as husband and wife. And so they were in this year of being espoused. And so um, having no marriage, sexual relationship, and Joseph was of the house of David, it tells us, which again is very important if this is going to be the Messiah, because prophecy tells us that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. So Gabriel sent from God, just like he was to Zacharias, to tell this good news about whatever. We don't know what it is yet. He was sent into Galilee, into a little town, a little city called Nazareth, to a virgin, which goes with the prophecy, who was a spouse to a man named Joseph, who was of the lineage of David. All of those things are very important. So just to kind of look back on just some of the similarities between these two occasions, um, Gabriel, the same name, the same angel to be the messenger, sent from God. Both of them are said that he was sent from God. Uh, both were impossible situations. Elizabeth and Zacharias were older. She was past the age of childbearing. Mary had not had any kind of sexual relations. She wasn't living with her husband yet. And so both of those were basically seemingly on the surface to us, impossible situations. And then they're to people of no importance. Zacharias was a Levite. He served in the temple. He wasn't anything overly important. Mary, just basically a young woman like any other young woman that lived in this little city of Nazareth. So nothing, nothing special about either one of them. But you know, God chooses people that are not necessarily special to work through. That's why he can choose us when we're not necessarily special to work through and to accomplish his plan. Uh, another thing uh, I didn't throw in there about being a spouse, if you remember uh, in Matthew, I think in Matthew's account, it talked about Joseph being a good man, had decided, had thought that he would just put Mary away privately. They would literally have to divorce because they were bound by law, and he didn't want to cause her any more shame than he, you know, he didn't want to cause that, and so he wanted, he was, he thought he might just put her away privately. Um, in their society, she could actually be stoned for, um, you know, the, that kind of activity. Uh, at best, or whatever you might say, uh, she would be shamed and ridiculed for having a relationship outside of marriage and, and of course, this pregnancy outside of marriage. So this is, um, this is just kind of the setup that it was to a little town called Nazareth, to a virgin named Mary, and to a man named Joseph who was in the lineage of David. And then in verses 28 and 29, the angel actually speaks to Mary. He begins to speak to Mary. And the angel came in unto her, and he said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind 
what manner of salutation this should be. Can you even imagine? This angel appears to her and starts with three compliments. So an angel is standing before her and he starts basically with three compliments. First he says, thou art highly favored. Okay. The Lord is with you. Okay. And blessed art thou among women. That's just not normally what someone comes up and starts a conversation with you about. And he starts with hail, which is more of a rejoice. Rejoice in what I'm about to tell you. You're highly favored with the Lord. The Lord is with you. And you're blessed among women. He was about to tell her that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. God had found favor with this young girl. He was certainly with her. His presence was with her. And she was certainly blessed among women. Blessed to be the mother of the Messiah. And yet cursed, in a sense, to the heartbreak. Knowing that her son was rejected. Knowing that instead of having, having him and enjoying him and his family and his children, that he would hang on a cross. She didn't, you know, probably think that far in advance. She probably knew the prophecies, I'm sure. But, oh, the heartbreak that would come with that for a, from a mother's perspective. But... She was highly favored. The Lord was with her, and she was blessed among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. You know, it wasn't like she was taken by surprise and, you know, just wowed at the fact that an angel was standing before her. It wasn't as much the appearance of the angel before her as it was of what the angel said to her, the message that he was giving to her that took Mary back a bit. And it says, and she was troubled at his saying and her and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this is. Cast in her mind is like she was contemplating that. She was, I, I say it all the time, rolling that around in her mind. Like what is going on here? What in the world is going on here? This angel just basically paid me these three compliments. And I don't know what's going on here. What is going on? What is about to happen? So the manner, what manner of salutation is this? What, what is going on here? What are you about to say to me? You know, um, the perplexity of it, I think, is kind of, it's like, Ew, this is kind of a perplexing situation if she were putting it maybe in our terminology. Um, what does this have to do with me? What's going on here? I think is, is kind of the question. And then in verses 33, 33, and the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of the kingdom, of his kingdom, there shall be no end. You remember, almost the very first thing out of the angel's mouth to Zacharias was, Fear not, don't be afraid. And that wasn't what came out of Gabriel's message first with Mary. Now, after she has kind of, Mary hasn't said a word, but Gabriel knows that she was troubled at his saying. It says she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind. What kind of salutation is this? She was perplexed. She was questioning what is going on here. And so the angel says, fear not. It's almost like, it's okay, Mary, just calm down. I'm about to tell you what's going to go on. I'm about to tell you about it. 
And so the fear not came later with Mary. And so he says, fear not, Mary, and literally calls her by name. For you've found favor with God. And then he begins to tell her the real news, the real message. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Oh my goodness. So when is all this going to take place? Because I don't even really have a live-in husband yet. So how in the world can you imagine what is going on in her mind? In their society, you just didn't do that kind of stuff. And so the angel is saying, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And then he goes on to describe the son that she's going to have. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So here we are to the real news. You're going to have a son, and you're going to call his name Jesus. So she's got to be thinking, how in the world is this going to go on? How is this going to happen? I'm not even living with Joseph yet. And then she has to start trying to process that he's going to be called the son of God, the son of the highest, not the son of Joseph. He's going to be called the son of God, the son of the highest. And God is going to give him the throne of David. Joseph was of the lineage of David. And then it says, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. This is bringing us from this moment in time where the angel says, you're going to have a baby and it's going to be Jesus. From that moment in time to show us that it's for eternity. It is for eternity. He shall reign over the house of Jacob, over Israel forever. But of his kingdom, there shall be no end. There shall be no end geographically. There will be no end ethical, ethnically. There is no end Jew or Gentile. There is no end to his kingdom. Geography will not contain it. Race or creed will not contain it. He is going to be the son of the Most High. And you're going to call his name Jesus. And he will reign forever, for eternity. You know, both times when the angel appeared to Zacharias, he said, and you'll call his name John. You will name him John. And here when he appears to Mary, you will call him Jesus. You know, when you named something, you may name your slave, you name your animal. When you named something, it indicated the authority and the ownership of that. And certainly with these two servants of God, with John and Jesus, God had authority over them. They were absolute servants of the Most High. And so we see that, that line of, of servitude and in John and of course the perfect service of Jesus the suffering servant of Jesus and so God named them both to show his authority and his his ownership of them his placement his role their point in time and so Mary hasn't said a word to this point and now Mary talks then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So Mary is like, How, how can this happen? How, how can this be? Now, remember, when Zacharias questioned the angel and questioned God, he was made speechless until his baby was born. Mary, and I, I liked the way the, 
the um, the leader guide said this. It said, asking a question does not always mean to question. It's almost like Mary was um, not saying, not saying, how, how can God even do this? It's more like, how does God plan on carrying this out? She wasn't questioning God's ability to have her have a child without having a relationship with a man. She was just wondering how he was going to go about doing it. Okay, how does God have this planned? You know, seeing how it can't happen under our normal rules of nature because I, I don't have a, I'm not living with a husband yet. So how does God have this planned? And so the angel tells her, here's, here's your answer, Mary. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. God's going to do it. Plain and simple, God's going to do it. He's going to take care of it. And you know, when I read that, I thought, you know, if God is going to do that, if God is going to cause her to conceive a child, when she isn't even married and not having any kind of sexual relationship. He can also take care of the scorn and the, the problems that society could put on her as a result. And I think maybe Mary processes some of that. I, it doesn't say anything about that, but because of her response, I kind of wonder if Mary doesn't just say, you know, God's big enough to do that. He's big enough to take care of this too. I don't know, but something tells me that she was pretty trusting. So Zacharias questioned. Mary questioned, but evidently it was in a different way. And Zacharias became speechless until his child was born. That's a lot to take in. She was probably quite young. We don't know. We don't have any idea just how young she was, but she was probably quite young. That's a lot to take in. I'm, I'm a spouse. I'm engaged, however you want to say it. And I'm going to have a baby, and it's going to be the Son of God. That's a lot to take in for anyone, much less a young girl. You know, in the back of her mind, she might even be thinking, I could be stoned for this. I could be, you know, ridiculed. I could, my family might kick me out. And then the angel has more news. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So the angel says, oh, and by the way, I've got more news for you. Your cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant with a son. So the miracles just keep happening. And this is almost like, she here was this impossible situation, Mary, and by the way, she's six months pregnant now. Does that does that tell you God has every bit of the ability and the capability to do what he says he's gonna do? Yeah. So the angel giving her more news. And then I think verse 37 just sums it up. Verse 37 says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. We try to limit God. We try to limit God to what we know and what we understand. And God is not limited by our limits. The natural course of nature didn't mean a thing to God here didn't matter that that's not the way it happened with everyone else. He wanted a son. He chose a young woman that he favored. And he caused her to conceive that son. This God who created everything, he created the heavens and the earth and the animals and every human being. That was no challenge for him. All he had to do was speak the word, and this young girl became the mother of the Messiah. She conceived the Messiah. 
And so here is Mary's response. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. You know, Mary didn't say, what if they try to stone me? What if my parents kick me out? What if, what if Joseph decides he won't have me? She didn't say any of those things. Her response was, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Okay, I'm God's servant. I am God's servant. Be it unto me according to thy word. Whatever you say, God, I'm your servant. Let it be. Remember Isaiah's response when God called him. When God said, I've got a job for you to do. And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. And God said, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. They're not going to pay attention to you. It's going to be tough. And he said, I'll do it, Lord. Mary, knowing, knowing all the possibilities, said, I'm your servant, Lord. Let it be. Just let it be. You know, if we could have that response to God, just think of all the good things that could happen. She bore the Messiah. Had it not been for him, we would have no hope. No hope of defeating sin, no hope of eternal life. So if we can learn from this lesson to be submissive to God, to have a humble heart, then we can be usable to God. Don't try to make God fit our mold, but be submissive and humble so that we fit his mold, which is perfect for us. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word. Okay, God, I'm here. Use me according to your will. I'm in for the long haul, God. That should be our attitude.